Let me tell you, just reading there in part one. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because, you know, I get tired of seeing this. I watched the mainstream media here in the slash shooting up there in Arizona. Okay, I watched them flip it and say, loners. Okay, that's right. Or suggesting anybody that speaks up against the government. In other words, what they're saying is anybody that sees what the government's really doing, and it's not asleep, it's not group thinking. They don't got the ability to look to see what's going on and just believe whatever's handed to them in a fucking silver platter. Okay? And so, because of this, it's prompted me to do this because there's things people didn't think about. You know, most times when major people speak up or get up in public, public figureheads like the scale that was shot in the head, when you go to these events, people go there by the hundreds and, uh, the police and security, they have lines, and so these people that are speaking are speaking in front of a crowd, but they're in a situation where people can't just walk up and approach them, okay? And that's 90% of the time. But it seems in this situation, hmm, they must have lacked security. Security must have stuck their head in their butthole, because it seems like our killer up there... Um, he just got to walk right up to her and put a gun to her head and blow her head off, you know? It looks like he just got to walk right up, so he was on the other side of that line, wasn't he? Now, they didn't think about that, did you? How many of you people been to these things? How many of you realize 90% of the time when somebody like this is speaking, um, and all the people that show up to see him, they have a line, man. The people ain't allowed to cross that line. Only certain people on the other side of that line, and the law makes sure of it. But in this situation, he just happened to be on the other side of that line, didn't he? Now, how did he get there? Hmm. Oh, that's right. Our security had their head up their ass like right there on mile 11, didn't they? Okay, well, anyhow, we've been telling you over here at TFL for a long time now that the majority of people who kill are created by people around them. You create your own killers through the way you treat other people. <coughs> sure, sure, now and again, somebody might really have some mental issues that will cause them to do it, but the majority of all mental issues are caused by other people onto other people. That's no lie. The majority of all mental issues are caused by how we are treated in our lives. And when they send this stuff at men, well, I guess maybe they have a good reason for sending it at men. But, on the same hand, the reasons that people kill there could be many, and they could be strung out, but the majority of the time, it comes right back down to the way they were treated in their life. What's happened to them in their life? But we don't take that into consideration. We think that we can treat anybody any way we fucking want. We don't give a shit how we treat another human being, isn't that right? We can treat them any way we want, right? Well, that's not so. That's not so. That's why this stuff continues to happen. Has nothing to do with speaking up against the government. Anybody got their head out of their ass and looked right now, they would realize we're in a whole lot of trouble. But they don't want to see it. They're not going to want to see it until it's all the way up their ass. Okay, so that's fine. And the only reason you're hearing them bring up speaking up against government right now to call them a nut is because your government's busy trying to cover the criminal asses. Once again, like they always do, okay? They don't want you knowing the truth. Truth is not to be known. Remember, we're in a world where lying becomes norm. Anyhow, let me show you some things because this all leads to what I'm talking about. So here, watch out. We're here with uh, Christine Paolillo. Yes. Following her arrest, Christine Paolillo is being interrogated. After three years, investigators are determined to hear the details of how four teenagers were gunned down that summer afternoon. Will you start off and explain to me what what happened that day, what you know? Uh, well, let's, why, why don't we cover before you went into the house? Before? Before you went in the house. The investigator asks about Tiffany Rowell and Rachel Colarudis. What was the nature of the relationship with you and Tiffany and Rachel? Um, we were pretty good friends. Like, uh, we hung out a lot at school, after school. But the person police really want answers about is the mystery man with Christine in the now famous sketches. The man, the anonymous tipster called Chris, a 
a man Christine's clearly afraid of. I need to make sure he's not going to be able to get me on the camera, right? Yes. Promise me that. I promise you that. Turns out he's Chris Snyder. At the time of the murders, he and Christine were an item. Were you romantically involved with Chris a few years ago? Yes. Was he your boyfriend? Yes. One her mother and stepfather did not approve of. I, I wish there was some way I could have gotten him to go away. But there, unfortunately, wasn't. Snyder, two years older than Christine, was a loner who'd spent time in jail for armed robbery. He was also controlling, her parents say, and resented her female friends. He started isolating her from, mm -hmm. from her friends, including Rachel and Tiffany. It wasn't just Snyder's criminal past that disturbed them. He also had a reputation for doing drugs, yet Christine stuck with him. He had some sort of mental control over her that we couldn't break. Very controlling, very, um, very scary person. To the point of making violent threats, she says. He get almost satanic talking about um, people. Like, I wonder what it'd be like to, to kill someone. Or... Psychologist Gail Saltz reviewed parts of Christine's interrogation tape and found this section particularly telling. It's almost like he was a father figure to me because he'd always, you know, said you take care of me and the dominant male in your life. Yeah, this is the that part of you know my life that was taken out once and now like he, he's feeling that. It makes sense psychologically, says Dr. Saltz. If you've lost a father very early in life, you may be susceptible to making a man that comes along in your life overly important. So important that you would potentially do anything for them. That might help explain why Christine stayed with Snyder. But the bigger question, why would he or Christine show up at Tiffany's house and gun down everyone inside? Police thought they found the motive early on in the investigation. There was drugs that were sold from that residence. There had been no adults in the house for a while. Tiffany's father had moved away and left her alone to finish her senior year. Unsupervised young kids, it became the hangout place. It became uh, a place where kids would gather. Police believe her boyfriend Marcus was a drug dealer at Clear Lake High School. Are you talking minor drugs, marijuana, party drugs? What, what kinds of drugs? Uh, marijuana and ecstasy were the primary drugs that, that, that they had access to. In fact, just weeks before, Chris and Christine had partied at Tiffany's house. She told police they went there on the day of the murders because Chris wanted to score drugs for Marcus. He said, let's go to... Uh, the homeboy's house that uh, we went to for that party, Marcus's, or whatever, he can hook me up. Was your theory at that point that this had to be some kind of a drug deal gone bad? Yes, and it was very well known that they would sometimes have cash and or drugs in the home, and they did not have weapons. And Dr. Salt suspects Snyder may have had a deeper motivation to cut Christine off from Rachel and Tiffany. Typically, in an abusive relationship, the abuser wants to isolate, dominate, and he would be jealous of and potentially want to get rid of anybody else in her life. As the interrogation goes on, a distraught, chain-smoking Christine Paolilla reveals that after parking the car near Tiffany's house, it became clear Snyder was up to no good. Did you go in the house? Yes, I was, I was right behind. I was behind Chris. Okay. Like I, st I stayed behind him, like the whole time, like the whole time, because because okay. I just I felt so bad. I was just so scared, you know. Okay. I thought. Let's cover that. Okay, I'm sorry. You thought what? Like I thought that you know, he was gonna shoot me. You know, I, I had no. Idea. She says once inside, Snyder became aggressive. I knew like Chris started arguing with Marcus, and you know it was getting loud, and and that's when that's when I heard I heard the first gunshot. You know, I wanted to run to bed, but I couldn't. I was just like, I was so scared. It, it felt like I kept hearing like, you know, kind of like, you know, the bubble wrap stuff. Just like pop, 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 pop like that. 
Christine claims Snyder forced her to take a second gun, and now he made her fire it. So the gun was in your hand? He was holding on to it, too. Okay, like on top of your hand or something? Yes. Like, I was scared, and I was, like, crimping, and then I, uh, I had made the, the gun go off. Not, not purposely, though. How many times do you think it went off in your a, hand? A million times. It, it went off a bunch in your hand? It, it felt like a million times. In essence, in essence, she was trying to say Christopher Snyder killed all the people and she just basically held the gun. She insists Snyder threatened to kill her and her family if she talked. So she says she composed herself and reported for her shift at this Walgreens where she'd been working. You could have called the police from there? Yes. Why didn't you? Because I was so scared. I felt that if I didn't do what he said, he was going to shoot me. She tells investigators she was eventually able to get Snyder out of her life and has no idea where he's gone. But what she doesn't know is that the police are already on his trail. Very quickly, we developed information on the second suspect, where he was. When the tipster first calls, he tells police the murder weapons belong to Snyder's dad. Police execute a search warrant on his parents' home in Kentucky. And lo and behold, in the father's uh, bedroom was a little gun safe and in that gun safe were the murder weapons. Chris Snyder is nowhere to be found. Detectives use phone records and his MySpace page to track him to Greenville, South Carolina. But Snyder learns about the manhunt before they arrive. The police find his body in the woods. How did he die? Chris Snyder went out the coward's way. He ultimately uh, killed himself by overdosing. Christine blames her now dead former boyfriend for the crimes. But police aren't about to let her walk. Now 20 years old, Christine Paolilla is charged with capital murder. I truly, in my heart of hearts, once again, do not believe that she was put on this earth to spend her entire life in jail. And what's happened is a tragedy. She's as much of a victim as these poor kids. She's not the one that, that did this. The one that did it is gone. Okay, you're probably wondering why I showed you that. What does that have to do with this? Well, that has a lot to do with this, okay? That has a whole lot to do with this, and I got some more to show you, too. Okay? Yeah. Okay, and I'll tell you why. What you've seen there in this story was examples, okay? Examples of how he treated her, okay? Examples of how she didn't have critical thinking skills of her own. Examples of how she blamed him for pulling the trigger, but she says he was holding her hand on the gun, and she kept pulling the trigger over and over, and I mean, it's just on and on here, but the reason I showed you this story is because this is examples. See, controlling, trying to tell somebody else what to think, what to do. That's right. Okay, what did we see there? That's what we see going on in today's society, isn't it? And then, of course, we see her lame excuses. She was just as involved. And then we see the drugs, okay? That's right. The CIA and your government places on the streets for you, by the way, just so that you know that. They do place them on the streets you to have. That's why you find liquor stores and stuff in all the Bronx and the low-income neighborhoods because they want you to be drunk. They want you to be drunk. They want you to be high. They want you to have drama. They want you to fight. That's our ability to get along. That's an, and why would he be so jealous and controlling of her, you would think to yourself. Well, there's a really good reason for that, and I'm going to show you that in part two. Or actually, it'd be part three, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. I'll show you that in part three. But the reason I pointed these out, because these two, this story right here, has got a lot of similarities to what causes a person to kill another person. And what happened here? Hmm, there's people dead here, ain't there? That's right. Of course there was people dead here. And then what did we see? Oh, well, he took the collars away out, and uh, what did she do? Oh, well, she lied her butt off, too, to cover her own ass, just like he would have to begin with, okay? Just like you all do, lie to cover your butts up, but anyhow. Uh, follow me over to part three, and I'll explain this further.